Jesus sounds a little bit like a fairy tale. Now there are some inherently scandalous parts of the story. A pregnant teenager, a rushed wedding, long and difficult journeys across dry and rugged terrain, giving birth in a stable among lots of smelly and noisy animals, and then being visited by some dirty shepherds and some strange scholars from the Orient. But thanks to our common Christmas carols, our idealized greeting cards, television shows, and modern movies, all of that unpleasantness seems to disappear as we watch a children's nativity play or light our Christmas candles on Christmas Eve while we sing A Silent Night, which we will do in just a few minutes. But a few years ago, I too gave birth, and I can testify to the fact that that was a not-so-silent night. <laughs> so on this evening, I invite us to get real, just to leave all that pretentiousness behind for a minute, and to bust the fairy tale myth of Jesus' birth, to reclaim the magic and the wonder of that miraculous night by embracing the truth, our truth, who we are and how it really was. Let's begin with that troublemaking carol itself. You know, in 1816, a young Austrian priest was walking from his grandfather's home to the church that he served. And when he arrived, he jotted down six verses of a simple poem about the quiet beauty of that night. And then he put them away, and he nearly forgot all about them. A year later, Joseph Moore was called to serve as assistant priest in St. Nicholas Church in Oberndorf, Austria, a place that I've been. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Austria. Anyone to Oberndorf? Yeah, it's a beautiful little village even today. And Joseph was in charge of worship music there. He, ex he was expected to write poems and songs for special services. So they had original music every Christmas Eve and every Easter Sunday. In the Christmas Eve of 1818, one year after Joseph arrived in Oberndorf, he was at that little church early in the morning doing what pastors do, which you might not know. We show up early, we check to make sure all the lights work, that the tree goes on, that we have enough matches, that there's enough chairs set out. We want to make sure everything's perfect. And so Joseph was there in that little church, and he was also the church musician and organist. So he sat down to warm up, and that organ failed to make one single note. It was Christmas Eve. It was the most important night of the year. And so Joseph started tinkering. He pushed the keys and the pedals, and he was pulling on things. And he began to get panicked, and he climbed over behind the old organ to look at the back of the console to see if something has happened. But he couldn't find anything wrong. And yet that organ refused to make any noise at all. It was completely silent. And Joseph Moore was filled with panic because he knew as the assistant priest what the senior priest expected of him and of their choir. And so he said a quick prayer and he raced back to his home across the village and he wildly fumbled through his office until he found that little poem that he had written two years before. And with that in hand, he rushed over to his organist's house. Joseph was only 26 years old on this crazy night and his organist was named Franz Gruber. Franz was a school teacher and he was 31 years old and he got quite a fright when he heard Joseph pounding on the door. It was Christmas Eve. Joseph should have been at the church praying, calm, peaceful, <laughs> and preparing. So Franz opened the door, greeted Joseph and invited him inside and as Joseph quickly sped out the whole story, the organ won't play a note. I have this song, this poem, it's really brief. Could you please make some music and bring it down to the church so the choir can learn it in time for tonight's service? <gasps> and Franz thought, oh my lord. But he was up for the challenge. So he prayed with Joseph Moore and Joseph left and Franz spent a few hours composing a very simple tune, a tune which he carried down to the church just a few hours later. And Joseph Moore learned the keys on guitar, and the choir was there ready to rehearse as our choir was here rehearsing before you all arrived tonight. And he said, we're going to do something a little different. And he taught them that simple song, Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, the original written in the German language. Now, what should have taken these men a few weeks 
to plan and prepare and create only took them a few hours. I don't know if that sounds anything like your Christmas season, but I know it seems like we've been in a tizzy for weeks now. And the funny thing about the story, Silent Night, is that if that organ weren't broken, or if two men hadn't rose to a challenge in the face of necessity and expectation, we would never even know that song today. And the only reason it survived is that a few weeks later in the new year, there was an organ builder and repairman named Carl Marocker. And he was down in Oberndorf tinkering with the St. Nicholas Church organ. And Reverend Moore told him the frantic story of Christmas Eve and sang the little song that he and Franz Gruber had created together. And Carl quite liked that song, so he jotted down the lyrics and even the notes. He was a music man himself. And as he went about the country repairing organs, he sang that song and gave it to church after church, to choir after choir. In the 1800s, there was also a tradition in Austria of families traveling around and singing folk songs. I'm sure you've heard of the movie, The Sound of Music, and the Von Trapp family. Well, the reason that was funny is because it actually was a thing, and that happened a lot in those days. In fact, in 1832, there was one family named Sasser who sang Stille Nacht in a concert in Leipzig, and the Prussian king, King William IV, heard it and asked that the National Cathedral Choir sing it on Christmas Eve that year. It was gaining in popularity, this little song from this little village, and a few years later, in 1839, another Austrian singing family named the Rainiers performed it in English at Trinity Church in New York. That was its American debut. And by the Civil War, Silent Night had become America's most popular Christmas carol. By 1960, it was the most recorded song in music history. Many of you may know this, but during the Civil War, fighting stopped on December 25th for four days. And troops from both sides, the Unionists and the Confederates, laid down their weapons and came together to read scripture, to share gifts, and to sing Silent Night. Tonight we follow in the footsteps of those soldiers. We lay down our weapons, our differences of opinion, politics, and religion, as well as our anger and our fear. We come together to read ancient scripture, to share gifts, and to ponder the nature and possibility of peace. And yes, in just a few moments, we too will sing A Silent Night. But first, I invite us to take one more moment at the manger in Bethlehem to visit a 14-year-old girl and her frightened new husband. Mary and Joseph are in his parents' stable because their family's guest room or in, as translated in the Greek language, was filled with other relatives who were visiting town due to be registered for the census. You see, these Jewish people were not Roman citizens. They lived in the modern regions of Palestine and Israel, and they were occupied territories of the Roman Empire. They had little freedom, and they adhered to strict Jewish law found in the first five books of our Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. Since giving birth, rendered a woman and everything that she came into contact with ritually unclean, Mary and Joseph were forced to deliver their child in a stable, which was likely a cave beneath the family's home or even out back. These were very humble accommodations, even by first century standards. And I can picture an angry, disappointed, scared young woman as she clings to a local midwife tears sprouting at the pain of her contractions, perhaps even screams, which she tries to muffle so as not to startle or offend her in-laws who were waiting just upstairs or just next door. It was certainly not a silent night, the night that Jesus was born, but it was most assuredly a holy night. While Mary labored, angels appeared to nearby shepherds. But this little scene is much different than you may at first picture. You see, herding sheep was a dirty and thankless job in first century Palestine. Shepherds didn't own any land, and so they grazed their sheep on other people's property. 
How would you feel if your neighbors brought their dogs to your yard every day to do their business? Shepherds weren't very well liked in society. They were strong and gruff and independent young men, but they were seen as unfit for society, an outcast to the fields. And about those angels, well, in the Bible, angels are very rarely fat little winged cherubs. <laughs> the word, which is translated here is, as angel, is more usually translated as the word messenger, a normal human person bringing news, kind of like a modern newspaper or a TV news show. Perhaps a stranger was passing by Joseph's home and heard Mary's cries and noticed a bright star as he headed out of the town. So when he stopped for a rest or perhaps even a smoke just outside the village, he told the shepherds who were gathered there what he had seen or heard. And then the Bible says a whole crew of messengers or angels appeared. Whether there was light in the sky from some astronomical anomaly or whether the light was in their faces and in their hearts because they had come into contact with baby Jesus. Either way, these messengers shared the good news of great joy with an outcast band of men in need of acceptance and love. Sound familiar? You know what makes tonight holy is just that, the sharing of good news that promises to bring us great joy. In a world filled with violence and anger, where a global refugee crisis and mass shootings in our schools, churches, and workplaces have become common, we are in desperate need of some good news, don't you think? When our modern messengers are only bringing sensationalist reports of crime, evil, and suffering, we need the story of a scandalous, tiny little baby whose life was a gift to the entire world from a loving creator God who offers us a way to stop the pain. Even in the middle of war, like those soldiers so many years ago, we can lay down our weapons, consumerism, narcissism, isolation, and even self-righteousness. No matter how outcast or enslaved we are, we are invited tonight to the humble cave to meet a baby lying in a stone trough in a feeding pen for the animals. A baby who will become a man, who conquers death and offers each of us a new beginning. That is no fairy tale. It is a not-so-silent night, but it is a miraculous and holy night. And I invite you this evening to join in the wonder. Kim, if you would mind playing for us, I would like to sing for you the first verse of Silent Night in German so you can hear how it was originally intended. If you'll grab your candles as soon as I'm finished, we'll all join in the next three verses together as we pass the Christ light around the church. Mm -hmm. 